A Brave New World for Planning will be published on the 18th of November. Now, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice are famous for having written some of the most popular musicals of all time. But back in 1970, the production that first set them on the road to success began not on stage but on vinyl, a double album no less, made with some of the finest rock musicians of the time. Comedian Matt Berry argues it's not only the best thing they've ever done, but one of the greatest records ever made. <laughs> My mind is clearer now At last all too well I can see Forty years ago, an unknown 22-year-old Oxford dropout and his equally obscure 26-year-old writing partner released what would become the best-selling concept album of all time. Their names were Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. And the album was called Jesus Christ Superstar. Jesus! What's the bus? Tell me what's happening. What's the bus? Tell me what's happening. I was 15 when I first put my headphones on and listened in awe to this epic offering. I had never been to a musical, nor did I have a clue who Lloyd Webber or Rice were. So I listened in total ignorance. What should you want to know? Don't you mind about the future? What I heard redefined for me the boundaries of what a record could actually be. A rock musical? About the relationship between Christ and Judas? And the events leading up to the crucifixion? It was a mind-boggling idea. It's at this point I'd like you to do something for me. Forget cats, forget talent shows, forget grinning dancers, and forget leg warmers. Because this album has nothing to do with those things. If you haven't already given this a spin, then you could be in for a treat. It's important to remember that the album came first, long before the stage version. MCA Records boss Brian Brolly took a gamble on two unknowns, gave them a studio to record in, and the pick of the artists on his roster. The musicians came from Joe Cocker's Grease Band, Alan Spenner on bass, Bruce Rowland on drums, and guitarist Henry McCulloch. The vocal department was also top draw. Jesus was played by none other than Deep Purple's Ian Gillen, and the lead part of Judas was taken care of by Murray Head. For me, the genius is in that very decision putting Judas centre stage, portraying him as a man instead of the usual monster. I caught up with the brains of the outfit and I had a few questions to ask those cats. Yeah. One, take one. If there is anything original in the concept, then it's the Judas point of view. Exactly. I mean, he's, he's not against Jesus. He recognises that Jesus is an extraordinary figure, but yeah. he, he, he opens up the debate. What, what are we going to... What's going to happen? They can mm. crush us if we go too far. I remember when this whole thing began No talk of God, then we called you a man And believe me, my admiration for you hasn't died Tim asked us up to Andrew's flat to hear an idea of theirs. Um, Andrew played the piano, not particularly well. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't a, you know, a great pianist. Um, plunked it out of the thing and Tim sung, Jesus Christ, superstar! And it was like a sort of... It, it was a shock. You've got to be joking. <laughs> a song about uh, uh, about Jesus. Um, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, I'm up for it, you know, yeah. Lloyd Webber lucked out with his band because these players are well and truly in the pocket. There's not a second of plastic rock on this whole record. Bruce Rowland, in particular, the drummer, yeah. was very intrigued by the whole idea. I mean, you know, they all thought it sounded insane. Yeah. And most of the time they were zonked out of their heads. <laughs> so anything sounded insane. Once you'd got that foundation, that underpinning, that bass, you know, that, that bass and drums, once you got the, you know, the rhythm section sorted, it was there, the heft was there. And it just seemed like doing 
a gig with different lyrics, you know, it's just, it was just, it seemed a continuation of what we'd all been doing. And as I say, the fundamental thing was we all wanted to play at all costs. We all wanted to sing, play music uh, everywhere we went. I remember talking through with Ian Gillen about the entrance in the temple and saying that I really think it should go as heavy metal and over the top as possible, but we've still got to hear the words. Mm. And that performance he gives there, I, I've never heard since. There was one performance when he was doing a brilliant take and then ad-libbing, he went, baby! You know, he sort of kind of thought he was in a, suddenly in a sort of rock song about yes. um, and that. My temple should be a house of pure prayer, prayer baby. baby. Yes, <laughs> not, not a good idea. <laughs> Lloyd Webber's palette was wide. Not only was he listening to rock music, but there was a heavy dose of European experimentalism. I can hear Karloff, Leggetti and Prokofiev and the best example of these cats in action is in a track called The Arrest. Now listen to this. It's terrifying. <laughs> I kept my old vinyl collection, which now is rather good news because it now looks as if vinyl's coming back and CD is going. Yeah. Um, but I keep coming across these strange bands like Ultimate Spinach and things like that, <laughs> and I can't even have played them. With their well, these were my influences at the time. What on earth was I on of myself? <laughs> you know, who listened to these albums? So. I suppose some people would say it's eclectic. Well, yes, it is, because you know, I was discovering Prokofiev and Shostakovich. There's a heck of a lot of uh, Russian influences yeah. in this. I'm and I'm unashamed about it, because I was a kid when I wrote it. Superstar went super global. The album went platinum, launching the careers of Rice and Lloyd Webber and paving the way for the theatre production, a show which has now been translated into over 20 languages. But the stage versions I've seen don't come close to the original album for impact or atmosphere. Uh, if you could change anything about this, um, what would you go back and clean up or, you know, get rid of or...? Well, of course, musically, I wouldn't have done some of the things the same way now, but, you know, I don't think I'd want to change it because it's what it is. It's a piece of its day. And I'd love to hear it done again. I mean, it's what we wrote when we were fairly young, even younger than we are now. And um, it, it, I, as Andrew says, it's of its time, but at the same time, it's still around. So we must have been doing something right, and I like to think it'll still be around in 40 more years' time. Don't get me wrong, the album isn't perfect. King Herod's song is ridiculous, and in my opinion, jars with the rest of the album. And I don't believe anybody in the history of anything has ever said, What's the buzz? But these are trifles. It's brilliant. One for the MP3 player, maybe. Next tonight, the unique work of Austin Osman Spare, an intriguing...